Narrative shots have been fired from the story gun of Echiro Oda. Shots containing ancient monarchs, murdered monarchs, and even former monarchs imprisoning current monarchs. And all of this because Cobra mentioned three things. Queen Lily, a letter from Queen Lily, and a D, which, which is also a letter, but like a different kind. How wild was it when Eam just casually strolled into the throne room out of nowhere? I mean, for a gender non-specified silhouette, Eam certainly has quite the two pack of nuggets to allow him to risk appearing here and think certainly do not bode well for Cobra. Although I guess we already knew that with the whole with the whole him being dead thing. But this whole return to the reverie flashback feels like a rapid unwinding of a, what unwinds? A ball of string and it's about to reach a sudden and shocking conclusion. Something that did not happen with Bonnie and her unexpected team up with Sabo. I was shocked at just how easily that whole thread was handled. Maybe it's because I expect Bonnie to be a bit of a violent fueled wild card, but this chapter showed us a completely different side to her. Bonnie was, I'm gonna say uncharacteristically chill, and that was because she knew that her father's body was safe in the hands of Sabo and the Revolutionary Army. Coming into contact with Sabo was like Bonnie being given permission to finally exhale. Because for this very brief moment in her life, Bonnie had the comfort of knowing that, yeah, everything's gonna be okay. And then it's immediately on to the next thing, Egghead Island, where we get to worry and cry and be angry all over again. The Bonnie-Sabo connection is something to keep in mind though, and I hope it does come up in conversation with either Luffy or Robin. Say, for example, when they do eventually learn learn about that funky newspaper that shows Cabo, oh, Cabo. Sabo, Sabo is his name. For example, when they do eventually see that newspaper showing Sabo standing over the corpse of Cobra. Bonnie could reinforce that by going, yeah, look, I don't know, made that Sabo seem like a pretty cool dude to me. Because Bonnie knows that Sabo is Luffy's brother, right? I think that's been public knowledge ever since Dress Rosa. And we did actually see Bonnie reading the newspaper after Doflamingo's defeat. If not though, then the brotherliness was also brought up in the newspaper, which declared Luffy to be the fifth emperor. And Bonnie pays very close attention to the news. This section was pretty incredibly important though, mostly due to the conversation between the castle guards. In fact, if this conversation had not happened, then Sabo may very well have left the castle when Bonnie did. Because the guards mention this funky, mysterious room, and Sabo can't help but take that as an invitation to investigate. That nameless and currently faceless guard is potentially weirdly responsible for everything that happens next, including the crowning of Flame Emperor Sabo. But with this, we have a new Oda mystery. In fact, we have a couple in this chapter, but the room being referred to could be the big refrigerator kind of space where the straw hat is being kept, or it could even be the Chamber of Flowers, which is where Emu seems to spend a lot of time. Oh, um, by the way, here is a thing that people tend to forget. Emu isn't the only mysterious figure in that room. There is also a silhouetted subordinate talking to Emu who we know even less about. So just who is this person? That's actually a very common question that gets asked quite a bit in chapter 1084, and let's now dive into Cobra. His interaction with the elders starts out quite typically, essentially, Cobra says, perhaps I should tell you everything that you already know, just in case we're in some sort of fictional pirate comic and the readers need a bit of a TLDR, which they do because it's legitimately difficult to keep up with all of the void century information that's been scattered across a thousand chapters. But this conversation leads very nicely into Nefertari Lily, another in a long line of tantalizing Oda silhouettes, because just as houses are built with bricks, one piece as we know it is built with silhouettes. And Lily follows the Nefertari naming scheme that we first encountered with Vivi and her mother Titi. So assumedly they just go through the alphabet and once that's done, they, they start again. But a female monarch of an Egyptian based civilization can't help but give me some very clear patrophiles. Oh, and actually something quite frankly disturbing that I learned recently is that the pyramids of Giza were built around 2500 BC, which means that Cleopatra actually lived closer to the founding of NFTs than she did to the building of Giza. But Lily was one of the 20 founding monarchs. The first of the founding members who have been named actually, but due to mysterious reasons, both did not join the world nobles, nor did she return to Alabaster. For all intents and purposes, Lily just vanished. Only to reappear 800 years later, trending on Twitter with over 32,000 tweets following this chapter's release. The discussion is quite tense because I genuinely don't know if the elders are trying to lie to Cobra because they genuinely don't know what happened to Lily. I mean, these guys are not all knowing. They have big gaps in knowledge. Oh, and also don't worry because we will be diving into the wild Lily theories very soon. One panel that stuck out to me was the emphasis on the 19 weapons being placed around the empty throne, or at least the upper tier of the empty throne. As the world government expanded, it now has close to 200 weapons in this room, but mostly scattered on the lower tier. But to go back to the lovely sounding chamber of flowers, Emu may very well have Lily's missing weapon there, which Emu uses to repeatedly stab pictures of people that he assumedly doesn't like very much. 
I'm not saying that Emu is Lily, yet, but perhaps her unpledged weapon was kept because Alabaster was one of the 20 founding nations. Cobra then goes on to conversationally whip out the D, which is the point at which, if it hadn't been decided already, I think both the five elders and Cobra knew exactly how this interaction was going to end, which to be clear, is in a very corpsome manner. I have to say, it feels a lot like a Bond movie ploy, you know, when Bond is all like, ah, well, you've bested me, Mr. Bad Guy. But before you brutally murder me, could you please reveal all of your secrets. Sadly, Cobra is not quite as suave as a secret agent, but hey, that is exactly what Sabo's for. We know that he's going to enter this room at some stage, and Cobra asking these questions may very well allow Sabo to eavesdrop on answers that were never intended for his uncultured swine ears. Also, another new mystery, the letter left behind by Lily. Oda loves doing this, and I love when Oda does this, but this is like a mini new Odin journal. A historical artifact passed down containing blunt answers to many questions questions that we, as readers, will probably not know until close to the end of the series. Although speaking of questions, I do question the decision-making of Cobra here, because let's say he knows he's going to die. Sure, that's fine. But revealing that letter puts all of Alabaster in danger, because at that point, the world government can't just murder Cobra and keep all of that nonsense quiet. They would then need to find and destroy that letter. And in doing that, hey, it might just be easier to wipe the entire island away from history. Even knowing the name of the ancient kingdom was enough to warrant the destruction of of O'Hara, all because of one word, and this letter is confirmed to contain multiple words. Words plural, plural being the word for, for plural. What? And I feel like a bit of a proud parent now because I got to witness Emu's first word, which was Lily. And this is going to be a pretty wild anime moment because if Emu's identity isn't revealed in this flashback, then it falls on the anime to make some pretty major decisions regarding Emu's voice, whether it's male, female, high, low, accent, etc. all of which is pretty huge information to have. I have to say, as terrifying as Emu is, I did find him quite adorable in this chapter, specifically when he's sitting on the empty throne. <laughs> he looks so cute. Because the chair looks so massive and hey, maybe it is. Perhaps we've been very wrong about the scale of this magnificent throne. But either way, it makes Emu look like a teeny tiny Emuling when he's sitting on it, like a toddler sitting in their parents' comfortable armchair. I'm hoping it's just massive because I love the scale of the throne and I think it adds very much to the weight of what it represents. You know, the whole idea of this one chair is simply too big for any single entity to fill. I mean, single basic human entity, giants and such, we have those and forget, forget that. Uh, chair big, people small would take like 20 people to fill that chair, so it should just theoretically remain empty. But now let's get on to some insanity. The biggest and most hypestest of conclusions drawn in this chapter is the possibility that Emu is Lily. And perhaps that's why there were only 19 weapons around the throne, because the 20th party is the one who sits on the throne and you don't really need to pledge a weapon to yourself, but get problems. One of which is that I can't help but remember that one time that the five elders referred to the Nefertaris as traitors, which would be a weird thing to say if their supreme overlord was a Nefertari. I think, and bear in mind, this is going by the still almost absolutely nothing we know, but based on that, I think it's more likely that Emu knew Lily and that might even explain his fixation with Vivi. Oh, and also let's get this prediction right out of the way. When Lily's design is fully revealed, it's gonna be Vivi. I'm pretty sure it's just gonna be an alternate costume Vivi. But I've even seen ideas that Lily didn't return to Alabasta because she ended up founding Amazon Lily because they have the same name. And to that, I'll give a solid perhaps. You can never discount any possibility in this series, no matter how wild. But I do think that we should prepare for some potentially insufferably wild Lily theories in the near future. In fact, I wonder if I could think of one right now. What, what's the stupidest thing I could think of? Ah, ah, I've got one. Okay, great, cool. S so get this, right? Nefertari Lily and Amatsuki Toki are the same person. Lily never returned to Alabasta because she traveled forward in time, like whoosh. And she was looking for Wano because the Alabaster Poneglyph said that that was the location of Pluton. She changed her name and potentially her racial heritage so as not to draw suspicion because she knew that Emu would know if she was she. Because Emu and Lily were former lovers and Lily is going to travel once more to appear in the modern day at the very climax of One Piece to confront Emu. And we're going to know that it's both Lily and Toki because she'll have that same thigh scar that Oda fixated on for some reason, possibly because he just wanted to draw some thigh. 
But that's the sort of thing I'm preparing myself for. With that said though, I love this development, especially because Vivi is a straw hat, and this is another one of those fatesome events, like Zoro's historical thread with Rima and Luffy's inherited joy boyishness. It's a really great way to bring Alabaster back into prime focus after having been arguably irrelevant for so long. But we are still not done. Fukuboshi, Ryuboshi, and Manboshi, names I never expect to say, are in the chapter and fighting against former warlord of the sea, Bartholomew Kuma, which is one of those events that I file under the, huh, I never expected to see that much up. Fukuboshi says something fascinating that alludes to his knowledge of Kuma, something about how far he's fallen and how sad it is, sad Kuma, sad. And I just find it interesting that Fukuboshi seems to know so much about Kuma given his relative isolation. I guess Jinbei was a warlord, so he could have told them a lot about Kuma. If Jinbei knows much about Kuma, has Jinbei and Kuma ever interacted? I don't, I, uh. But an unexpected highlight of the chapter for me was Leo of all of the characters. I'm not typically a big fan of the Tontata tribe, but I think that there could not have been a better character to lay down this St. Charles smack fest. Quite literally one of the smallest teeny tiniest living things in the world, standing up to the authority of a world noble. It just works and good on Leo for that. Sai joins the punch party as well, bringing along a kick for some variety. And this is actually the same attack that he used to defeat Lao Ji on Dressrosa, the dragon drill nail. And that attack is no joke. Sai's leg right there is infused with Haki and this may very well be the hardest that St. Charles has ever been hit. To clear up some confusion here though, Most Guard allows Sai to assault Charles whilst imploring Fukuboshi to stop because he has a kingdom to think about. Now this gets tricky because a lot of people tend to mistake Sai for the leader of the Kano Kingdom, whereas what he is is the leader of the Hapo Navy, which is the main military force of the Kano Kingdom. The King of Kano is actually this dude right here. His name is Ramen, and we actually see him at the Reverie and Garp's comical flashback where all of the kings are holding bats, right next to this uh, this very Hitler-esque man on the left. But TLDR, Sai himself is not a monarch, so his actions can be passed off as, yeah, rogue soldier does stupid things. Not my fault, not me. But also the confusion doesn't end there. Because I've seen a truly surprising amount of people speculating over whether or not St. Charles is actually dead, despite the chapter title stating attempted murder, and despite the fact that he was already confirmed to be alive in chapter 1054. But what we do know now is the identities of the culprits, it's Sai and Leo. So I imagine that they could now become a major target for some sort of holy knights. But also I think that this chapter might answer one of our big questions, which is why Kuma is heading back to Marijuana. The last order given to Kuma before he was taken by Morley was to kill St. Moskart. So there's every chance that Kuma woke up and has now returned to Marijuana to carry out that final order. Meaning that whether it's a flashback or in the modern day, the Reverie arc is still far from over. 